So before we kind of get started, um, I want to mention, so for Wednesday, um, we'll still have class. I'm not going to use iClickers. If you do end up you know, having a specific uh, session you want to go to for dialogue days, I don't want that to over like penalize you. So I won't be using iClickers in class. We're still going to be having class. I'll still kind of record the lecture and everything. I just want to kind of make sure I mention that before we get going into that. Any questions for me before we jump into material? I mean, we have that kind of third homework that's like setting out there. Uh, you should be able to get through about two thirds of it. After today, we'll start talking about monopolies. You probably start working on that last third. Kind of throughout the rest of the week, we'll just kind of continue to talk about uh, monopolies. We have one small topic before we get to monopolies today, but for the most part, this week will be kind of reserved to talking about monopoly problems. So we left off kind of thinking about firms' cost structures, right? how we can determine what their profit level is. And then we had to talk about different ranges of, in the short run, potentially, firms may not exit or enter the market. They may like continue to operate at a loss, but they're minimizing losses. Okay? So in the long run, what's going to happen? Because in the long run, we know all fixed costs go to zero. Fixed costs only exist in the short run. In the long run, we can change everything. So we want to start thinking about making the, the, the different or differentiating kind of our long run and our short run supply curve. So for the market or the industry overall, right, our industry supply curve is going to reflect the relationship between price and the total output. Right. In the short run, it, it's kind of looking at that same relationship, but for a fixed number of producers. Right. In the short run, we don't think about firms entering and exiting the market as, as often, right? Because they may continue to operate to minimize losses. If the same sort of cost structure and price persists over time, you know, eventually when they can change all those fixed costs and they're still seeing a, a negative economic profit, well, then we said it would be better just to shut down, right? There's zero. But that's only in the long run when we can drive these fixed costs down to zero. So we'll have kind of this short run supply curve, but then we'll have a long run supply curve. We don't worry too much about it, kind of different, differentiating these. Um, kind of walk through some steps showing how what happens when we move from the short to the, to the long run. Okay. So these short run equilibriums, right, is, is kind of what we were looking at last class, where we said, look, firms still have fixed costs. So we're thinking about in the market the equilibrium prices where quantity supply is equal to quantity demanded, right? But that our number of producers is kind of fixed, right? A lot of these firms will continue to operate at a loss, but it's just because they're minimizing losses, right? In the long run, if we get rid of those fixed costs, those firms might exit the market. So I think I've got here, um, you know, if we kind of want to compare our, our short run supply curve, right? We think about here's our equilibrium price, right? It's where supply is equal to demand. If we think about maybe, uh, well, I'll draw it up on the board so we can at least have a visual of it. What we had talked about was the market and the firm that's you know producing in that market, those two things are linked. So I've got my supply and demand curve. Here's my equilibrium price. I'm thinking about the quantity the firm produces. They're going to take that price, and that's going to be their marginal revenue curve. I was said. Uh, wherever that price is coming from, these aren't perfect. I didn't draw this perfectly, but it's supposed to be kind of this horizontal line, right? We then said, okay, maybe it's at this point. So there are marginal cost curves. Marginal costs are initially decreasing because of specialization, and then increasing, you know, diminishing returns to labor. At the point where marginal costs and average total costs intersect, we said that's always going to be at the minimum point of that average total cost curve. If the price ends up hitting our marginal cost curve at that point, we said the optimal quantity will always be, so the optimal quantity for the firm is wherever price or marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. However, profits, we said where the quantity the firm produces, times the difference between price and the average total cost at that point. So here, the price 
and average total costs are exactly the same. So this would be a mark where we say profits would be equal to zero. So in the market, we could say, okay, this is the price where profits are equal to zero. That's kind of what that's saying, the market price where profits are equal to zero. In the short run, we also know that there's going to be a difference between average total and average variable cost because we still have these fixed costs. If we saw the equilibrium price, here, what did I call it in the graph? I can just call it shutdown price. This would be the price which, if the equilibrium price ever fell below this point, we said we were better off shutting down. If the price is anywhere in this range, we said we would operate in the short run in order to minimize our losses. Right? So if we shut down, we still have these fixed costs, right? But if we stay open, maybe we can, you know, eat into those fixed costs, like right? make a little bit of money so that our huge losses are maybe not quite as large. So we can map those points out to the market, right? Now, why would the price maybe ever fall this low? Well, if we see shifts in demand, right? Or shifts in supply because of other reasons, reasons other than firms entering or exiting the market, right? That equilibrium price could move around quite a bit. Questions or that kind of we talked about a lot of that last week. So, you know, we can think about the short run equilibrium is going to be if we can get to that point where that market price is exactly equal to average total cost for these firms. Um, one thing we're kind of assuming here, and this will get changed a little bit when we talk about monopolies. We said we have many firms and that they're all price takers. What we're going to assume is that in the we're looking at each individual firm, they all have the same resources. There's no barriers to entry. So everyone has opportunity to you know, have the same materials, you know, you know, similar size buildings. And so for right now, we're just assuming every firm has the same cost structure, right? But they would all have to face the same cost if they want to enter this market. There's no you know, regulations that would cause some firms to have higher costs than others. Right? So this is kind of our, our equilibrium point where this profit is equal to zero. If we then want to think about moving to the long run, right? in the short run, you could see you know, equilibrium prices anywhere in this range because some firms continue to operate. Even though they're operating at a loss, they're minimizing the losses. In the long run, all these fixed costs are going to be driven to zero. Okay? So think about if I get rid of this average variable cost, right? all my fixed costs right, are zero. So basically, my average variable cost will be the same as my average total in the long run. So in the long run, my shutdown price isn't here. Where would my shutdown price actually be? Average variable is actually equal to average total. Yeah, so wherever the optimal quantity is going to be, I wrote marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. Now that I have no fixed costs, if I ever see the price fall below this point, I know that my price would be less than average total. If price is less than average total, my profits would be negative, right? Because quantities either zero or positive, I can't have negative quantities. So the difference between price and average total cost tells me the sign of my profits. So if I ever see a price below this point in the long run, I know that would represent negative profits. If I'm earning negative economic profits, I'm better off just leaving and getting zero. Why get negative of 100,000? I can just leave, you know, stop producing, leave and get zero. So in the long run, our new shutdown price actually ends up being that same point in the short run that gave us zero economic profits. In the long run, if we ever see the price fall below average total costs, that minimum point of average total cost, which now is the same as average variable cost, right? We said we made the shutdown decision based off of average variable costs. Well, now that average variable costs are also average total costs, it's any point below that average total cost where firms would shut down and leave the market. Any price above that, you would have positive profits. And 
which the positive profits are, they're not, they're not even doing this. Right? Because remember, we're talking about positive economic profits. So it has to be the profits that I'm earning in this industry are greater than any profit I can make anywhere else. Right? The economic profits kind of capture those opportunity costs. So my new shutdown price is where profits are equal to zero in the long run. So what do you have here? We kind of walk through this, right? As long as price is greater than average total, my profit, profits are positive. You know, um, one thing we could see happen, even in the long run, if we had positive economic profits, if there's a lot of companies making money doing something, um, let me think of an example I can give you here real quick. Uh, something that you see a lot of people, oh, I got to give them. So this isn't a perfect example, because this isn't a perfectly competitive market, but it gives you an idea about positive profits and firms entering that. One thing that's kind of become really popular are like YouTube channels and podcasts, right? So there are people making large economic positive profits in podcasting and YouTubing. So what do other people try to do? Other people try to start their own podcasts. I've heard too many people tell me about this new podcast they're gonna start and I'm just like, okay, good luck. But, um, you know, if there's positive profits being made in a certain good, firms, Right, your people starting a business or starting a podcast are going to try to enter that realm. So we'll see kind of this increase in supply. So let's say in the long run, we had, well, actually, instead of this on the board, I think I've got a, a slide here. Let me take a look. Come back to this in a second. Here we go. So let's say uh, I was at this point where. My equilibrium price, this green line was like my original supply. Okay. So here was my equilibrium price. I go over, that's going to be the marginal revenue that firms face. So marginal revenue, get marginal cost at this higher quantity. Well, price is above average total here. So that kind of rectangle is reflecting positive economic profits. Right? Well, we said the Width was just the quantity the firm was producing, multiplied by the difference between price and average total cost. Well, if the price was above average total cost, that's a positive amount. So firms were earning positive economic profits. So other people say, well, I want a piece of that, right? So they enter the market, so supply increases. When supply increases, that drives the equilibrium price in the market down. If more and more people start podcasts, right? The value of every podcast starts to decrease, right? So that new equilibrium price hits my marginal cost curve here. So each firm that exists in the market now produces a little bit less, right? Maybe we see the overall quantity in the market go up, but that's just because we have more firms. Think about it this way. If I have one firm producing 100 units, right, then the supply in the market is 100. But if I have two firms and now they each supply 75 units, well, each firm is producing less, but total, right, 75 plus 75, they're, they're making more than what the old existing one firm did. So as firms out of the market, supply increases, that drives down the equilibrium price. As the price falls, right, the difference between price and average total cost is going to get closer and closer to zero, where eventually enough firms will enter where we get to that point where profits are exactly equal to zero. There's no longer an incentive for anybody to join that market. In fact, if the price was driven down to this minimum point on my average total cost curve, if people continue to join that market, what's going to happen? Let's say we're at this point where we got profits equal to zero. Whatever the price was, this was the price where profits were equal to zero. If people keep joining this market, what's going to happen? What's going to go down? Profits, right? Well, what, hap what happens first, right? So we see this supply increase. Well, I can shift to the right, right? More producers, more sellers. My new equilibrium price would be somewhere down here. So that's going to be my new marginal revenue curve, that firm's space. So wherever that marginal revenue, where the price hits marginal cost, this lower quantity. But notice here, price is you know, way below average total. 
So if we're at a point where profits are zero, if firms enter this market, they just drive the price down lower and lower below average total. And now we end up with every firm in that market have, having negative economic profits, right? So then there's another correction, right? If there's long run negative economic profits. What do you think some firms start to do? Start to leave. If they start to leave, what happens to my supply curve? Starts decreasing, shifting back. Probably to the point where then profits are zero. Now there's no incentive for anyone to leave, right? Now in practice, right? We don't, you know, I was using this as a hypothetical. Like if people didn't realize that there's no more profits to be made in the podcast industry, but they continue to start up these new podcasts, well, they'll drive profits down, and a lot of podcasts will then kind of stop right, or leave the market. And podcasts are kind of a weird example because I don't know what the unit would be. I mean, maybe the number of podcasts or something that the person's doing. But the idea is that if we get to that point where profits are equal to zero. There should be no incentive for anyone to kind of leave or enter that market unless we see more changes to demand and supply, right? unless we see the equilibrium price start to change. Any questions here? Verifications or what if this happens? Or... So I kind of went through this a little bit on the board, right? Let's say we we're starting out. You can see here the equilibrium price where it hits marginal cost way above average total. So we've got huge economic profits happening. So more firms enter the market, right? Supply shifts to the right. That drives down the price. Well, now price hits marginal costs at a lower quantity. It's still above average total, but notice kind of that rectangle that represents the value of profits. If there's just more firms that exist in this industry now and they've driven down the price. Each firm is earning fewer profit, smaller amount of profit. The profits have decreased. If it then continues, more people, there's still positive profits. So firms enter, supply shifts even more until it gets down to this break even point where profits are exactly equal to zero. So what we say is that in the long run, profits should be exactly equal to zero in a perfectly competitive market. Any questions on, on this? Um, I think I have one more. We kind of went through this in the board, but you can imagine like maybe the price is $14 here. We're at a point where profits are equal to zero. We then see a demand increase, right? So maybe like initially we're in the long run. We've got profits equal to zero. No firms are entering or exiting the market. Right? But then we see, I don't know, maybe income goes up. This is a normal good. So what's going to happen? Demand is going to increase, which will drive up the price. So now all the old existing firms who were previously making profits of zero will now be earning positive economic profits, right? Because that price was driven up. So the price is driven up above average total costs, profits are positive. In response to that, what's gonna happen? Firms are gonna enter the market. So this demand increase will then cause more people to wanna join so we would see a supply increase in response to that. As more and more firms enter this market, that starts to drive down the equilibrium price until we get back to that price of well, here, 14, or that break even price where profits are exactly equal to zero. So in the long run, even when things change in the market, right? Even when things shift that demand curve, suppliers kind of respond to that shift and either enter the market and drive the price back down where profits are zero. If something happened where it decreased demand, that's going to cause price to go um, down. It's going to cause negative profits if we were starting at a point where profits were equal to zero. And then once there's negative profits, firms exit, supply decreases until we push that price back up to the point where profits are equal to zero. So it doesn't matter if we see demand increase or decrease, supply will respond accordingly until in the long run we drive that profit back to that point where it's equal to zero. The price is exactly equal to average total cost. Questions here? So, I think we don't have to worry about this. Um, I don't want to worry. We, we'll skip this. I'm not going to answer any questions uh, related to, to this idea. Um, I want to kind of progress a little bit. Yeah, don't worry about this slide. When I repost the, the complete versions, I'll just take this one. So in the long run, right, 
what ends up being true is not only do we see profits be equal to zero, but remember we talked about that long run cost curve. We said in the long run, right, we're going to have economies of scale initially where if we produce more, our costs are decreasing. Eventually, we get to a point where if I want to produce a higher quantity, we'll have diseconomies of scale. We said our average cost would be increasing. In the long run, we end up on that minimum point of our long run average cost curve. And at that minimum point, over time in the long run, right, it's from enter and exit, we end up in the long run at, uh, at this point where profits would be exactly equal to zero and we're at the lowest point on our long run average cost curve. Questions here. It's kind of relating. We talked about that, that long run average cost for last week. It was kind of reflected all these different things we could change in the long run. So I think I initially started out with thinking about moving from a small to a medium to a large plant, right? Well, here, whatever we change in the long run to where we get that lowest cost curve, in the long run, we'll be on that lowest cost curve and the price will be hitting that minimum point so that we've lowered our costs as much as we possibly can, but profits are still equal to zero. And that's, that's because of this entry and exit that firms are doing. I don't want to go into the opposite. But I have a, uh, I have something else I think I want to show you. Oop, that's related to all this. Now you can see just this work, more and more examples of this helps. So let's say, we start out, um, got some market here. We've got supply, demand, here's my equilibrium price. Here's the quantity of the firm I'm going to choose. They're taking that equilibrium price and that's gonna be their marginal revenue. And let's say we're currently at a point where we're like in long run equilibrium where profits are equal to zero. So we know that if profits are equal to zero, that minimum point on average total cost curve should be with the prices. Right? And we also know that minimum point on our average total cost curve is where the marginal cost intersects my average total cost. So here we're at a price where profits are equal to zero. And we'll call this star one. Okay. We'll put a one in everything here. So I'm going to show you what happens with some changes. So let's say um, so if we're in the long run equilibrium. What's going to happen if here? So let's say before um, to produce I don't know, any, any kind of good that you think of as a person a factory, so maybe it's like gears or like parts of an automobile. What if over time, right, we see this improvement in technology? So that it becomes less, you know, less and less expensive to produce these parts. Um, I want to think of a good um, something that everyone in the market starts doing. So let's think about uh, like. Um, oh, Like your, your parts for your phone. So, you know, like Apple, like a charger or something like that. Let's say that they couldn't kind of put a patent on any of that. Um, I remember back in the day, like there would be a million, they see them all over the place now, but like TJ Maxx at, up front, they always have like these off brand headphones. And <laughs> like, like gas stations always have these off brand headphones. Well, back in the day, like go back 20, 30 years, I mean, you weren't seeing headphones in gas stations because it took a lot more money to, to potentially produce these, right? So over time, uh, we see this technology improvement where you anyone anyone can make anyone can start a company where they're making it. Or if you want to maybe think about t-shirts, right? Or kind of you know you outsource and you can really produce t-shirts and put your design on anything. It's very low cost, right? And that's because our technology has improved to the point where 
it's so cheap to produce these things. So over time, we've seen this reduction in the marginal cost, right? So to produce the same units, every firm is now facing way, way lower costs. So that's going to kind of shift, right? We think about here. Our marginal costs at each quantity are going to be much lower. Or we already said, we think about supply curves for any one firm, I'm going to supply more to the market if I have lower costs. So even at the same price, right, I can now supply more to the market because it costs me less to produce these. Well, part of my average total cost calculation was factoring in whatever my marginal costs were, right? whatever costs I was adding to total. So we would see something like um, this. Well, I've got to make sure I'm hitting at the minimum point, right? Let's try to go here. So my new average total cost curve is going to be lower as well. Right? At every quantity, it costs me less to make these goods. So if the price stayed the same in the market, what would happen initially? Well, price is now hitting marginal cost way out here. Right? So each existing firm, the firms that were around when profits were equal to zero, are now going to produce a lot more of this good. And the price is going to be well above average total costs. So what happened to their profits? Their profits were originally zero. So their profits going to be now. Not giving the exact value, but they're going, to, they're going to increase, right? Price is much higher than average total cost. Now. So you know the existing firms start producing more of these goods, and there's positive economic profits. Well, what do other people start to do? They look at this industry and say, well, shoot, there's money to be made there. So we would then see more people kind of enter this market, right? As more people enter this market, it starts to drive the price down until the price kind of falls down to that new minimum point on the average cost, total cost curve. So even if we have costs changing over time, this entry and exit of firms would still push profits down to zero. Now, in the short run, initially, when we see these costs change, like immediately after we see like technology improve and costs go down, there might be a period of time where we see the existing firms are kind of earning positive economic profits. But then over time, once we get kind of to the, you know, allow firms to enter the market, they'll drive that price down where profits in the market are back down to zero. So there could be like a, a transition period where we do see positive economic profits. But we know that if nothing, you know, if technology didn't change, we would have been kind of staying at the same point. If technology did change and kind of drive those costs lower, initially we'll see positive profits, but then firms will kind of enter that market, drive that price down, until we're back down to where that profits are equal to zero. Kind of adjusting to what the new cost structure would be. Any questions on this? So what's interesting about understanding that what would happen if these costs change is what was one of the things that we said would shift supply? So we said supply reflects marginal cost. So what's really happening when we were talking about things that shift supply and demand, we were thinking about things that shift supply and demand even in the long run. And so that's why we said if input prices go down or technology improves, that actually increases supply. And the reason why it increases supply is because those things would cause positive profits to exist in the market, and then more firms would enter and ship it. So, like we learned that lower costs would increase supply. But the intermediate step there was that lower costs created positive profits in the industry, which then caused more firms to want to enter that market. So now we don't just have this like rule that we never had. We actually understand the kind of process through why it's current. Any other questions can relate to this? We're going to kind of now transition to, to kind of bring up monopolies here, kind of start to tackle a market that's not perfectly competitive, but actually a monopoly exists. <laughs> just don't know what questions to ask. So one thing I did want to bring up for you, I think it'll help us think about their cost structures as well. 
as we're thinking about this equation for profits, what we're really saying is we're going to take the amount of units that a firm is going to sell. Right? That was kind of the, the optimal units that a firm sells that we determined from where marginal cost hits that marginal revenue or hits that equilibrium price, right? Because that equilibrium price is on marginal revenue. So we'll take the number of units a firm decides to sell and multiply that by basically how much they're going to make off each unit and on average, how much it costs them to make each unit. So if I take the difference between those, you can almost think about this guy here as like the average profit made on each unit. So if I take my average revenue, well, I'm selling every good for the same price. So my average revenue is just whatever that price is. The difference between that average revenue and my average total cost, well, that's just kind of the difference between total revenue and total cost reflects profits. So if I look at the difference between my average total revenue and average total cost, that's really just representing the average profit made on each unit I sell. So if I take the average profit I make on each unit I sell, and multiply by the number of units I decide to sell, that tells me my total profit level. All right. So we'll transition here. Where did I leave that? There we go. So um, you know, we can kind of, this kind of has the conclusions of what we were just talking about with the perfect competitive market. Really, the, the main takeaway there is profits in the long run equal to zero. If things shift our supply or demand equations, right, so that the price goes up or down and makes, you know, creates positive or negative account of profits, firms will respond by either entering or exiting the market until we're back down to what profits are equal to zero. That's really all this, this slide is kind of summarized. Okay. So I'm going to go back and get down to an actual question. So unlike a perfectly competitive market, a market where we would say it's monopolized, where we have a, a monopoly market, would be one in which there's one seller of this good. Okay? So, you know, over there, we we're talking about firms entering or exiting this market. We were talking about there might be several existing firms. We don't have that in a market with a monopoly because there's only one producer, right? Um, so they have full market power, right? Before we said there's many firms, nobody could kind of charge a different price for that good because it was such a homogenous good. There were so many substitutes. I just go buy it from someone else, right? I go buy my gasoline, you know, half a block down the road. Well, what if you were in a town? I grew up in a town like this where there's only one gas station. Well, if I need gas, if I'm on empty and I'm, you know, at home, I have to pay whatever price they're charging, right? So we would say if you have a monopoly, they have like, they're not price takers. They basically have full control over the price. Okay? They can charge you whatever they want because they know that you don't have a substitute. You, there's, you can't go get it from somebody else. So what we would say that also exists with monopoly, maybe it's not just um, this idea of proximity, but sometimes they want to keep their monopoly power. It's good to be able to control the price. And so often we see in a market where there's a monopoly, there's a lot of barriers to entry. Right, so preventing other firms from entering. A lot of you know, this is the existing firm starts to you know maybe use the government to you know, lobby for certain regulations. Excuse me, that they know that like new small existing or sorry new small up and coming firms couldn't kind of meet all those regulatory uh, guidelines, and so there might be some barriers to entry to kind of ensure that they're the only producer of this good. So there's a couple different ways of, of how monopolies exist. I've kind of mentioned a few of them, but we'll kind of outline it a little bit more specific here. So barriers to entry kind of can, can take on three different forms. So the first one is if a firm owns a key resource. Right? So if, for example, uh, we go back a little bit, but I don't know how, how much you, you uh, maybe you guys have heard of this up to this point in your life, but the beers the, the, um, is a diamond, Manufacturer, I guess we call them, but they basically at one point in time literally owned like every diamond mine in the world, right? I mean, not every single one, but the vast majority, of them, right? So they had really the only supply of diamonds was coming from this one company. And it's because they owned you know, all these mines where this key resource was. Okay? This is kind of like, you know, they're not quite a monopoly, but the same idea as to why in the Middle East having kind of these huge oil reserves. 
they really dictate the price of oil, right? We've had to like make agreements with them that they're not going to increase it too much because they, they own the key resource. And, you know, a lot of other countries don't have that resource, right? So that's one way. Oh, that was the example I had given. So the government also um, sometimes will create monopolies, essentially. Um, it's, we'll kind of talk about why, probably uh, maybe Wednesday, definitely by Friday. So examples like this might be like the post office. Um, if you notice kind of regionally, there's a lot of monopolies. Like regionally, there's sometimes usually only one electric provider or one gas company within a certain area. Um, a lot of this is from government regulations that gives those companies rights to provide um, whatever utility we're looking at there. And this is really because we'll eventually find out that there's huge fixed costs, right? That if the government didn't give you monopoly rights and we had this perfectly competitive market, actually there would never be a firm that provides electricity because there would never be positive economic profits because the fixed costs are so high, right? If every single company had to run their own power lines, those are huge fixed costs. And if they have to then compete with other companies, there actually wouldn't be, a, there would be no ability to earn positive economic profits or even profits be equal to zero. Yeah. So is there a reason you distinguish uh, businesses as monopolies and not? Uh, why doesn't the government just fund them the same way they would fund any other taxpayer service? Okay. Yeah. So why would they not want to do that? So if the government just funded them, um, but they still allowed for competition. I mean, and I guess if you would fund every company, right, those costs start to get astronomical, right? If the government, if the government says we're going to provide infrastructure for 10 different companies, utility poles, and run all the what, the costs start to, to go up very quickly, right? So I guess what I'm asking is why you are road workers hired by the state, but then there's this middleman when it comes to electricity. Oh, well, I mean, I guess unless you wanted to allow every single road to be a total basically, right? Because we do allow, we have, we, they've given rights to, to the companies like the Indiana, how many years ago was it? They sold the, the rights to the total road basically because they couldn't operate it. They weren't operating it at, uh, at positive economic profits. Um, but they now allow a company to outsource the lay, allow them to run that. But the only way is because they can charge a price for you to drive on that road. If there's no cost to using a road, well, then no company is going to want to, you know, what company would just take on the, the cost of pro providing different roads if there's no revenue that can be made from? Them. So it has to be in like a revenue. Usually it's when there's a industry where there's a, you know, something that's generating revenue. The government would then kind of give the rights to, to be a monopoly in that industry. If it's something where there's no real revenue to be made, often what we would call that, and we'll down the road talk about those are public goods. And we realize that it benefits society to have roads that we can use, but there's no one company that's going to provide roads for you to use for free, right? So, and that's when the government will provide something like that. Does that make sense or answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if there's no revenue to be made, from, from providing this good. And usually that's when we see the government step in and pay for it, use taxes to pay for it. Um, we then also have natural monopolies. So there may be some industries in which, and when we start to work through these models, I think this one will make a little more sense, but demand just isn't high enough given the cost of producing that good that it can support more than one firm, right? So we kind of talked about over here, right? As firms enter a market, it drives down the price. Well, maybe that average total cost curve is just so high that when there's one supplier, they can earn positive profits. But as soon as there's a second supplier, it drives the price down so that it would be below average total costs. Well, now average total costs are, are above price, so now negative profits, firms exit. Well, if we only had two firms and a firm exits, well, now we're back to one firm. So natural monopolies would be an industry where the cost structure is such that as soon as we get that second firm, they drive the price below that kind of profits equal to zero point, right? Just at that second firm. So examples of this really, I mean, the government gives rights to a lot of these industries to be monopolies in different regions. 
But really good examples here for natural monopolies are usually um, utility, kind of different utilities as well, right? It's just if you ever had competing firms, neither one of them could ever make positive profits. Um, and a lot of times the government likes to give rights to these natural monopolies because eventually what we'll show through this or looking at a monopoly's cost structure is even if you allow them to be a monopoly, you can then, um, there are ways in which you can get some of the dead weight loss back that exists because you have a monopoly in the market. But that's kind of down the road. All of these are kind of foreshadowing what we're going to talk about. So to understand a monopoly's cost curve, it's going to look a little bit different than what we were doing with a perfectly competitive market. Okay. So they have the same, well, we think about kind of a uh, competitive firm's demand. Well, they were just facing their marginal revenue with whatever that equilibrium price was. When we're looking at their cost structure, there was no like demand for their product. But with a monopolist, right? We don't have kind of just this take this price as given for our marginal revenue. We're actually going to face the entire demand curve. We're the only seller of the good. So when we think about the market for a good, if there's only one producer, they face the entire demand curve. All of demand for the product is demand just from, to, uh, from the product from their firm. So they're the only firm providing it. And then the supply curve will just reflect whatever the costs were for that one firm, right? Here, you know, when we're talking about industry supply, we said it was adding up every individual producer's supply curve. We've only got one producer. The market supply curve is the exact same as whatever that firm's supply curve is. So the firm and the market will kind of be now starting to draw really at the same track, right? Because the industry supply will be the exact same as the firm supply. There's only one firm. So um, what ends up happening now is it becomes a little more complicated for us. So before we said marginal revenue was just equal to the price. And marginal revenue was constant across the number of units I sell because I had to just take the price as given. Well, monopolies aren't price takers. And so now our marginal revenue curve isn't going to simply be the price. It's going to be a little bit more complicated. So just to kind of give an idea about you know, what, what a monopoly is facing, we'll think about the marginal revenues that a monopoly is facing. So we'll go through some numbers first. Next class, I'll show you some, some more graphs and then also kind of walk you through. I won't expect you to do it, but anyone who has a background, I'll do a little calculus to show you kind of where this is coming from, but it'll be very, very simplistic, right? I'll keep this like week, month one calculus, right? We're pretty easy. So if you haven't seen calculus, don't worry about it. I'll explain it in a way that's not like you have to have all these, have this previous knowledge. So if we think about a monopolist, right? And they're the only person selling this good. If they sell zero units and they decide to sell it for a price of $4.50, right? Then they make a total, oh, there we go, total revenue of zero. I can go through and fill in total revenue for all these different quantities, right? Just take the quantity, multiply it by the price I'm selling the good for. So I sell one unit at $4, total revenue is four, two units at $3.50 each, it's seven, three units at $3 each, three times three is nine, right? And really where that's coming from is just this demand curve. If they're the only person selling that good, they know that if I charge the price of $4.50, no one's going to buy the good. If I lower the price a little bit to what, $4, I can get one person to buy. Lower it to $3.50, two people buy it. So they're just looking at the different combinations of price and quantity from that demand curve. So we would go through every single quantity on that demand curve and the price associated with it, and we can calculate total revenue. If we now have total revenue and quantity, how would I calculate marginal revenue? Remember, anytime we talk about something being marginal, it's the change in that thing that we're interested in, right? Marginal costs or marginal revenue, the change in costs, the change in revenues divided by, we're coming from, a change in quantity. Well, here we kept it nice and easy. Quantity is just changing by one unit every time. So marginal revenue is the change in total revenue divided by the change in quantity. We've already, we've already talked about this. The same kind of thing applies to a monopoly. So if I look at the change in total revenue for that first unit, it goes up from zero to four. So four over change in quantity going from zero to one, this is a change in one. So this one will be easy. Because every change in quantity is one, we can just go through and look at the change in total revenue. So here, zero to four, we get a marginal revenue of $4, four to seven, three, seven to nine, we get a marginal revenue of two, 
All we're doing here is looking for the change in my total revenue to determine what marginal revenues are. Right? So we kind of come up with that marginal revenue column. If we wanted to do average revenues, we could as well. Hopefully at this point, we're starting to realize that averages are pretty easy. We just take whatever we're interested in finding the average of, whether that's cost, revenue, whatever it is, and divide it by the quantity we produce. So average revenue for that first unit is easy because it's a total revenue of $4. I'm selling one unit. So the average revenue I'm making on each unit would just be the $4, four over one. Average revenue for the second unit, well, I'm making a total revenue of $7 off those two units. So if I divide that seven by those two units, on average, I'm making $3.50 each unit. We kind of continue to go, go down the list here, determine what the average revenue is for each one of these different quantity combinations. But really the average revenue is gonna be pretty easy because when I'm getting total revenue, it's just price times quantity. So if I take price times quantity, that's how I was calculating total revenue. If I want average total revenue, what am I going to do? So average total revenue is total revenue divided by how much I'm producing. So if I divide this by quantity, unless I'm just left with average total revenue for a monopolist, it would just be whatever the price I could charge is. And that kind of makes sense. I'm the only person selling this, and I have complete control of the price. Well, whatever price I choose, that's going to be my average total revenue. But the marginal revenue is going to be a little bit different, right? Because I still have to base my price off of whatever consumer demand is. And so that's where these prices are coming from, is that original demand. So unlike a perfectly competitive market, marginal revenue is not constant. Yet. If a monopolist wants to produce a higher and higher number of units, what's happening to their marginal revenue? Yeah, it's going down. So that's going to provide us a little bit more of, a, of an you know, it's going to make the decision of how much we produce and things like that a little bit more complicated. So I think, uh, I think I'll save this where we at one time here. Say this for next class. We'll start out with this. Um, so very everyone here today. Let's see. Feeling nice today. So we won't kind of work through any, just whatever letter you kind of, Identify with today, I guess, or find your favorite, right? A, B, C, D, whatever represents you today. Go with that one. Everyone get it correct. Um, on Wednesday, we'll pick up and we'll do kind of how we determine what the optimal quantity of monopolist chooses is and get a little more of an insight as to what the demand and marginal revenue curve would look like if we graph that. Okay. All right. So I'll leave this open as you guys are leaving. Um, other than that though, I'll see you on Wednesday. Um, please start working on that homework. Don't save it all right up into the due date. You should be able to get through a little bit more than two thirds of it. You're the sole provider of the service. You're a monopoly. How do you dictate a quantity?